we're now going to look at non-indicative moods, the subjunctive, the imperative, and the infinitive. Let's look at what moods are. The mood is a relationship of the verb to possibility. The indicative is the mood of fact or reporting. It is a one-to-one -one relationship between the verb and possibility. I did my homework. The subjunctive is the mood of possibility. Its relationship is a possible relationship between the verb and possibility. I should, could, would have done my homework. The infinitive is a verbal noun that is not limited by gender or number. I need to do my homework. The imperative is the mood of command. Do your homework. And the optative will not be studied in this course as it is extremely rare in the New Testament. Let's start with a subjunctive mood. This is the second mood we will study, the indicative being the first. It would be the third if you include the participle, but the participle is not really a mood. We just put it in the mood category because we had nothing else to do with it. But the reality is the participle is not a mood. So the indicative is the mood of fact, as I said earlier, regardless of truth value. While the subjunctive is the mood of probability or possibility. In English, the indicative expresses the fact in the sentence, if I was king, that indicative could only be said by someone who actually could be king. So Prince Charles could say, if I was king, if my mother should drop off someday, I would be king, if I was king. If I say the same thing, however, I have to use the subjunctive, which expresses possibility, but not fact. I would say, if I were king, I'm never going to be king. I'm nowhere in the succession line. But if I were king, I would have done the following thing. With the subjunctive, the accompanying words are may, would, could, or should, as well as a host of other grammatical meanings. And the subjunctive is a very important part of conditional sentences, which we'll look at much later. Aspect. Aspect is the most important element of the subjunctive. The verb stem indicates the manner in which the action is performed. Unlike the present, the subjunctive present has no time element, where the present has both the elements of time and aspect, the subjunctive has only aspect. So, if it is a present stem, it would have continuous action. And if it's an aorist stem, it would have undefined action. And if a perfect stem, well, there's considerable debate on whether or not this form actually exists in Greek. So we're not actually going to be looking at the perfect. All we care about are the present and aorist stems in the subjunctive. The only difference between the indicative and the subjunctive in terms of form is that the connecting vowel in the subjunctive is expanded. So, 
Remember that we have possibilities of connecting vowels will be alpha and epsilon, and both of these will expand to an eta. And omicron will expand to an omega. So, in the verb agapate, you love, the subjunctive would only require the expansion of that alpha to an eta, to agapete. Ending's the same, form is the same. The only difference is the expansion of that vowel. If it's an epsilon, such as blepete, you are seeing, it is going to expand to blepete, you might be seeing. And the Omicron expands to an omega. So, for men, we are seeing the Omicron is going to expand and we're going to get omen. we may be seeing. Subjunctive tense formative. There are four subjunctive tenses that we care about. Two have no tense formative, and two have a single vowel tense formative. So, no tense formative would be the present and the second aorist, just as it is in the indicative. It has no tense formative. Now, those with tense formatives are the first aorist in the active has a tense formative of sigma, and its passive, the aorist passive, has a tense formative of theta. So let's look at the formation of the subjunctive. Now, in this case, we're going to be looking at the formation with an aorist stem because of the form. But this formation, remember, can either take the present stem or the aorist stem. And that's going to define its aspect. So in this case, we're just going to look at it since Lou is the same in both the present and aorist, we're just going to call it, say aorist stem. And that way, we can have a tense formative. In this case, theta, which is the aorist passive tense formative. And we're just going to put a present ending with expanded connecting vowel. And instead of ete, ete. Luthete. Y'all may have been loosed. So let's compare the present and subjunctive, active and middle passive. And we're going to use luo. First singular, luo, we recognize. The present active subjunctive, we can't expand the vowel because it's already been expanded. So Luo in the present active indicative is the same in the present and the subjunctive. I mean, sorry, in the indicative and the subjunctive. Luomai expands to luomai. Second singular, luace expands to luace. In this case, the epsilon expands to an eta and the yoda subscript. Lu a and subjunctive lu a. In this case, like lu o, the eta cannot be expanded, so the indicative and the subjunctive are the same. Lu a, lu a, lu a tie, lu a tie, lu amen, lu omen. Lu ometa, lu ometa, luete, luete, luista, luesta, and luusin becomes luosin. In this case, the u, the omicron upsilon, expands to an omega. Luantai. Lu 
So let's compare all of the subjunctive conjugations. First singular in the present active is luo, present active stem, and no tense formative. It's merged already. Second aorist, and we're using balo here because luo is a first aorist. We can't use it. So I'm just using balo for the second aorist. Balo, that that aorist sem, only one lambda. Second aorist stem, no tense formative. Then first aorist is tense formative is a sigma, so we get luso, first active stem, and the sigma tense formative. And then the passive is the aorist active stem and the tense formative. So if we look at all of them, it's wonderful. The only difference in these is the tense formative or a different stem. So uh, luo, luso, lutho is just change in tense formative. And the second aorist is a change in stem. Lues, bales, luces, luthes. Third singular, lue, bale, luce, luthe. First plural, luomen, balomen, lusomen, and luthomen. Second plural, luthete, balete, lucete, luthete. And third plural, luosin, balosin, lusosin, and luthosin. Let's put it together and look at some subjunctive examples. In the present active subjunctive, luomen auta, we might, should, could be destroying it. It's a present, so it is a continuous stem. So I'm going to translate it be destroying rather than we destroy it. The present middle passive subjunctive, lu ometha, who bow to, we might, should, could be being destroyed by it. Right? We're using it as a passive here. So being destroyed by it, and because it's present, it is a continuous aspect. Aorist active. Lusomen. Only difference is it has a sigma here as a tense formative. Lusomen auta. We might, should, could destroy it. Aorist middle subjunctive. Lusometha auta. We might, could, should destroy it for self. It is reflexive. Aorist passive. Luomen hupau tu. We might be destroyed by it. Well, that was fun. Let's look at another non-indicative verb form, the infinitive. The infinitive in the Greek functions like the English infinitive and more. In English, the infinitive is to run, to study, to love. The Greek has many char characteristics of the participle. Where the participle was a verbal adjective, and it could take on any of the functions of an adjective, the infinitive is a verbal noun and can take on any of the functions of a noun. As a noun, it can be preceded by a definite article. As a noun, it can be the subject of the sentence. 
The English gerund is the subject. To run is good for you. As a verb, it can take an object. I want to win. What do I want to win? It. So, to win can take an object. Can be used in the same way as the genitive absolute. Let's compare the infinitive to the indicative. That is, an infinitive verb to a finite verb. In this case, the finite verb is the indicative. And remember, it has person, and it can be first, second, or third. Number, singular or plural. It can have tense, and tense in the, in the, in the indicative is a combination of time and aspect. Both of those things exist and make up the verb. It has voice, active, middle, or passive. The infinitive verb, the infinitive, person doesn't have person. Number doesn't have number. Tense, only aspect. There is no longer any idea of time in the infinitive only aspect. The voice is active, middle, or passive. Infinitive endings. Now, as you remember, the infinitive does not have person or it does not have number. Therefore, there's only one set of infinitives for every active and passive form. Let's look at them. In the active, the present, ain is the ending. The second aorist is always the same as the present, so it is also ain. The first aorist is psi. That sigma we recognize as being a tense formative. And alpha yoda you're going to get used to as an ending for an infinitive. The perfect ending is can I. You see that kappa there? It's kind of a giveaway that we're looking at the perfect. So the present middle is esti. And of course, the second aorist has to have the same. So it's esti. The first aorist middle is sasti. And the perfect is sti. And the passive, this is a middle passive for the present, so sti, both the middle and passive are the same endings. In the second aorist and the first aorist, the aorist passive is thani. The first and second aorist have the same passive ending. Thani. And the perfect is sti because the perfect is also, like the present, is also a middle passive. So the middle will be the same as the passive. Perfect middle passive endings has no connecting vowel. It's kind of a giveaway. There's no expansion here because there's no connecting vowel.
So let's look at some infinitive uh, examples. Uh, the present infinitive. Chemes thelomen luen aute. See that luen? That is the infinitive, and that is the present ending. Its meaning is we desire to be loosing her. Remember, the infinitive can take an object, so loosing her. And because this is present, its aspect is continuous. So that's why I'm using to be loosing. Another, chemes thelomen luestai hupautes. In the present, the middle and the passive are the same endings. This is the passive. We know that because it's followed by hoop. That is by somebody. So we know it's going to be the passive. We desire to be continually loosed by her. Once again, I'm using a continuous aspect. The aorist. Hemes thelomen lusai aute. Lusai shows us arrows. We see that sigma. Hemes thelomen lusai aute. We desire to loose her. So rather than the continuous to be loosing her, this is aorist. It's undefined. It is not continuous. So we just, we, we're going to translate it as we desire to loose her. Hemes thelomen luthenai hupates. Thenai, that is a passive ending, theta, eta, and it is an aorist passive ending. So we get we desire to be loosed by her. It is an aorist. So, its aspect is undefined. The perfect. Cheme stelomen lelukenai aute. We desire to have loosed her. And heme stelomen lelustai hupautes. We desire to have been loosed by her. The passive, lelustai is the passive. And we really recognize that because it has no connecting vowel. And remember, the middle passive perfect does not have a connecting vowel. The complementary infinitive. Certain words in Greek almost always take an infinitive. If you see the verb, you can almost always expect there's an infinitive at the end of the sentence. So common complementary verbs are Day, it is necessary to. Day is it is necessary. Existen, it is lawful to. Melo, I am about. Probably an infinitive to do something. Dunamai, I am able to do something. Achomai. I am beginning to do something. Other complementary verbs include thelo, keluo, and ophelo. Let's look at some complementary infinitive examples to see how the complementary infinitive works. De auta luen. It is necessary to be loosing it. Luane, remember, infinitive can take an object. Existen auta balen. It is lawful to cast it. Melo auta nusai. This is an aorist. I'm about to loose him. Dunamai hupau tu luthenai. I am able to be loosed by him. Archomai autanuen. I am beginning 
to loose him. The articular infinitive, incredibly important. In the articular infinitive phrase, to Luain, Autan, Auta, Luain becomes a finite verb, in this case, the present case, the present tense, because it's the present active. Autan becomes the subject of Luain, and Auta becomes the direct object. So, a common translation of the articular infinitive is in order that, so that the phrase would be in order that he continually destroy it. See how it works? It's really quite beautiful that by putting that article in front, that ta, we change the whole thing. We turn it into, in a sense, a little sentence by itself. So, if we have the sentence, Elthen to Luane Autan Auta, we translated that he came in order that he continually destroy it. The articular infinitive and preposition. Now, since we know that this is a verbal noun, we should expect that it's going to be working with prepositions too. But it has a very specific way that it works with prepositions. Because an infinitive is a noun, it can be the object of a preposition, and the definite article takes the case of its object. And what a definite article, remember, a Articular infinitive begins with a definite article. In this case, it's always a neuter definite article, ta. And that ta will take on the case that the preposition requires. Of course, the infinitive never changes. Although it's functioning as a noun, the infinitive is the infinitive. Although very fluid, one way to divide the articular infinitives is result purpose and temporal. So we're going to look at these two ways of using the preposition with the articular infinitive separately. Result purpose. In order that. And this is without a preposition. So just by using the infinitive without, or without a preposition, in this case, Luane Autan, we get in order that from Luane, in order that he is destroying. Autan becomes the subject and Luane becomes a verb. In order that he is destroying and because Luane is present, then the verb is continuous. Ta Luane out ta, in order that he is destroying. The same meaning. So whether I put ta in front of this phrase or not, it has the same meaning. To Luane out ta, and again, in order that he is destroying. So these three ways of doing it have the same meaning. In order that, and now we're going to use a preposition. Ace plus the accusative. So, ace, taluane, autan, ace, and ta is in the accusative. It is a neuter, so the accusative is the same as the, the uh, <clears throat> subject, so we get ace taluane autan in order that he is destroying. Pros plus the accusative, pros taluane autan in order that he is destroying. Pros in order that. 
because this is with the preposition. Dia plus the accusative. If you remember, dia plus the accusative means because, because of, and its object will take the accusative. So we get dia to luen autan because he is destroyed. And the result with hosta. Hosta luen autan with the result that he is destroyed. The other form of use is the temporal. Pro genit plus the genitive equals before. So in pro plus the genitive means equals before, right? So pro to luen autan means before he is destroyed. N plus a dative means when or while. And to, and see how to has taken the case, the dative case, and to luen autan, when, while he is destroying. Meta plus the accusative is after. Meta to lusai autan after he destroys. Well, friends, I hope your ears are holding out better than my voice because this is a very long one. We're going to look at the imperative. Okay, take two. The imperative. Like the English imperative, the primary purpose of the Greek imperative is to express a command. Unlike the English, which has the imperative only in the second person, do, you do, Greek also has a third person imperative that is generally translated as let, as in let them eat cake. The Greek imperative exists in two persons the second and the third, in both singular and plural. The voices are active, middle, and passive, and tenses are limited to present and aorist, which only express aspect. Present expresses continuous aspect, aorist undefined. Like the subjunctive, the second aorist shares endings with the present, like all non-indicatives, the imperative does not have an augment, nor does it express time. Translation of the imperative. There are papers written on this one. The imperative, as we said, has only two tenses, the present and the aorist. And scholars are not really sure how the tenses were understood and there is no consistency in their usage. The best rule of thumb is to translate them the same, unless the sentence dictates a difference. In exegesis, it is wise not to spend time on the differences in these tenses for the imperative. Avoid exegesis that says, Jesus means continue carrying the cross because he uses the imperative in the present tense. That may be true. That actually may be very true. However, grammatically, I'm not sure. Imperative endings, present, active, and middle. The endings exist in the singular, which is the second person and the third person. And in the plural, obviously, second and third. In the active, there is no ending. And the middle, nu, which merges to omicron upsilon. Third, to. And its middle is stho. The 
plural second is te, the same ending as the indicative, and the middle is ste, same as the indicative. The third person is tosan, and the middle, as you would expect, is tosan. The active imperative for luo. The nice thing is there are not many of them because we're only looking at the second and third person. Okay, so second person, lue. First eris, no ending here, right? Lue, we, no ending. First eris, lusan, lusan. The meaning loose. Third singular, luetto, and the first eris, lusato, actually, absolutely expected. To is the ending, epsilon is a connecting vowel, and in the first eris we get sigma alpha. Meaning, let it loose. Second person, same as the indicative, luete, lusate for the first eris, and loose again. In the third person, luetosan, it's the same as the third person singular with the ending of san for the plural, and lusatosan for the first eris, its meaning is let them loose. And remember, like the subjunctive and infinitive, the second aorist imperative ending is identical to the present form, which is the reason it's not in this list at all, because it has the identical ending, using the aorist rather than the present stem. Hence, bale rather than bale with two lambdas for the second singular active. Let's look at the middle imperative for luo. And in this case, our translations for luo in the middle is going to be something for oneself. So the second person singular, luu, the first eris with that sigma alpha, lusai, meaning loose for yourself. Third person singular, luetto, First eris, lusas tho, meaning let it loose for itself. Second plural, lu este, lusas the, for the first eris, meaning loose for yourself. And the third plural, present, lu estosan, First eros, lusastosan, meaning let them loose for themselves. Once again, like the subjunctive and infinitive, the second eros middle ending is identical to the present middle, which is why it's not on this chart. Using the eros rather than the present stem, hence balu with one lambda, rather than balu with two lambdas, for the second singular middle. Finally, the aorist passive imperative of luo. Just want to remind you that the aorist has only one passive. So whether it's first aorist or second aorist, there's only one passive. They use the same passive. So the second singular for both the first and second aorist is luthati meaning be loosed. Third singular, lutheto, let him, her, it be loosed. Luthete, be loosed, second plural. And the third plural, luthetosan, let them be loosed.